so a very good, good morning to all the distinguished panelists and participants thank you all for joining on time for this session the topic of today's webinar is mental health and psychosocial support in disaster psychological first aid for community survivors so before the briefing of the webinar let me first welcome the patron of the of this webinar session major general manoj kumar bindal executive director national institute of disaster management i would also like to welcome and introduce the convener of this webinar session professor santosh kumar faculty and head governance policy planning and inclusive drr national institute of disaster management professor santosh kumar is an expert of disaster risk reduction policy planning and capacity development with more than 25 years of experience in different positions in the development planning and drr sector he holds a doctorate in economics and he studied gender and development in ids sussex uk and he has also received professional training in disaster risk management from israel backed with international work exposure at the world bank and intergovernmental body of sar he has also worked at state levels in different capacities in up academy of administration <coughs> nainital and ripa jaipur he is an experienced hand in designing planning and implementing mitigation and long term disaster recovery plan and projects welcome sir thank you thank you so before introducing the guest speakers let me give a brief about today's session as we all know that disaster disasters are complex global problem it is an inevitable truth of our life the disaster does not have physical consequences only but it also encompasses the other domains such as psychological and psychosocial dimensions every year individuals and communities are being affected by disasters which disrupts their mental health and well-being the psychological effects of the disaster are more drastic among children women and dependently elderly population after any sudden disaster or chronic disaster like the ongoing pandemic covid-19 they become the most vulnerable population mental health issues in general have been considered as a neglected subject as it is considered as a stigmatized problem mental health issues caused by disasters is even more neglected area the aftermath of disasters has a significant impact on the social economic and mental state of the victim community thus in order to fulfill the, fulfill this gap there is a need to understand this issue the emergence of uh, ongoing pandemic covid-19 especially the second wave is affecting the mental health of many people severely as everyone is directly or indirectly affected by this disease with this i would like to welcome the panelists we have today who have the expertise in this field and their experience and work will surely enlighten our knowledge and understanding towards the issue of psychological effects on a community during and after the disaster so first of all i would like to welcome dr subhashish bhadra dr bhadra has done his mphil and phd in psychiatric social work from the national institute of mental health and neuroscience bangalore he is currently working as an associate professor in department of social work and head of department of sports psychology at central university of rajasthan dr bhadra started his career in 2001 from intervention in gujarat earthquake and subsequently worked in gujarat conflict tsunami kashmir earthquake uttarakhand disaster and in various disaster affected areas in india and in other asian countries like china japan indonesia myanmar through different organizations like care india american red cross international federation of red cross oxfam india action aid international medical corps dr khadra is actively engaged in various disaster response programs community based interventions and lectures on disaster management issues in addition to providing support to different ngos working on psychosocial support youth development livelihood interventions community based rehabilitation inclusion of marginalized section etc in his credit there are number of academic articles and book chapters and two books published by nationally and internationally reputed publishers i welcome you dr subhashish bhadra welcome sir 
So now I would like to introduce Dr. Prashanta Kumar Roy. Dr. Roy has done his MPhil in Medical and Social Psychology from Central Institute of Psychiatry, Ranchi, and PhD from University of Calcutta. He is currently working as a faculty and head at Department of Clinical Psychology, Institute of Psychiatry, a Center of Excellence, Kolkata. In his credit, there are 37 research papers in international and national journals and books. He has 16 years of teaching experience. Dr. Roy is having disaster field experience since 2001 as volunteer and later as trainer for the community on psychological first aid on behalf of Medical Service Center, a voluntary organization as pro bono basis. He has received training of disaster, men disaster mental health from Red Cross Society and American Psychological Association, International Psychological Union, Taiwan, Minhans and Government of India 2017. Dr. Roy's areas of interest are cognitive therapy, hypnotherapy, community mental health, disaster mental health, and, mount and mountaineering. Welcome, sir. Now I would like to introduce and welcome Ms. Elora Barik Shil. Mrs. Shil has a master's degree in social work and MPhil in Psychiatric Social Work from National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore. She is an Associate Professor of Psychiatric Social Work at the Institute of Psychiatry, Center of Excellence, Kolkata. Recently, she was also the Head of Department of Psychiatric Social Work. She is associated with professional social work for the past two decades. Her areas of interest are mental health services, service-based research, on strength-based social work practice, community mental health, psychosocial intervention in addiction and family therapy. She has a wide experience of working with the vulnerable groups of the community, including children in different circumstances, elderly people, adolescents and youth, pregnant and lactating mothers, child addicts, marginalized women, and differently abled people of the society. She was also actively involved in the study and training of the, pers of the personnel related to JJ Act and rescue homes run by government and NGOs. She is a life member of the Indian Society of Professional Social Work and a governing body member of the Calcutta Samaritans. Welcome, ma'am. Now I would like to introduce our last but not the least panelist, Dr. Atik Ahmed. Dr. Atik has done his master's in social work from Madras University, Chennai, and PhD in psychiatric social work from National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore. Post PhD, he has worked as postdoctoral research fellow in ICMR funded by National Task Force on Migrant Health in Nimhans. Currently, he is working as assistant professor in Department of Social Work, Central University of Rajasthan. Dr. Atik's area of interest are application of social work in mental health and chronic illness, neuropsycho-oncology, neurosurgical illness, neurotrauma, psychotrauma, chronic renal failure, substance abuse, health accessibility among rural and urban poor migrants, application of research and statistics in social work. Welcome, sir. So now I request Professor Santosh Kumar, head GIDRR Division, National Institute of Disaster Management, to deliver his introductory remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ali. Uh, this is a very, very elaborate uh, introduction of mine as well as all the they deserve, but I do not know about myself. But anyway, this was a very, very uh, kind of a uh, important uh, initiative which you have taken uh, with uh, Central University Rajasthan. And I see the alumni of uh, Nimhans, uh, most of them, and uh, working with the different uh, areas. So this is very uh, kind of a innovative initiatives in terms of when we talk about psychosocial care for the community. And the community uh, is uh, like uh, why NIDM got into this is a different story I'll let you know but uh, first of all uh, let me welcome all the distinguished panelists on behalf of the National Institute of Disaster Management uh, 
with uh, some we have a very old associate like uh, Shubhashis Badra and uh, then we have Prashant uh, Kumar Roy uh, then we have uh, Madam uh, Elora and also Atik Ahmed uh, they are working in their areas uh, of excellence and uh, you have seen that uh, his engagement of Subhash's engagement is in since uh, Gujarat earthquake 2001 where we were uh, really engaged uh, at the uh, kind of a helm of affairs. Uh, that time I was not with the National Institute of Disaster Management. That time I was working with the World Bank. And the World Bank was the in charge for the long term recovery program. And we visited and we could see that what kind of a trauma which we had at the different levels. And uh, many of the disasters which we see is uh, talking about uh, that mental trauma care counseling every time we keep recommending so we thought at the national institute of disaster management we have a separate dedicated cell also which works on the psychosocial care and we have a great uh, kind of a collaboration with the nimhans also uh, together we have developed uh, different modules <coughs> currently also child centric disaster risk management center of an IDM that is also working closely with demands for addressing children issues. Uh, when uh, Ali uh, took this charge of community center and then we thought that how we can talk about community in the uh, disaster risk management, uh, victims, affected people and uh, responders every time we talk but uh, still in India the integration of uh, mental health has not been there with the physical uh, uh, health care when it comes to the disaster. Whenever disaster strikes, many a times you have, must have seen, it is the responders and the medical health professionals, they swing into action. And uh, later, uh, this mental health uh, uh, people go into that. So we thought that why not we have a kind of a constant hammering on this issue. And we also work with so that we can uh, take up this at the policy level where this could get integrated in the form of national disaster response force uh, national uh, state disaster response force and also other response agencies in the country currently covid 19 has given you a different dimension altogether and uh, it's the, when we talk about disaster at site uh, most of the disaster, whether Tsunami 2004 or Cyclone Ampan, Cyclone, uh, which we are receiving uh, last two cyclones, also three cyclones in the past during the COVID-19 time. Before that also Cyclone Fani, Cyclone uh, Gaza, Cyclone, all those cyclones you take the name and that was there in the kind of a, as a challenge uh, for the community health and uh, especially the mental health care. So what is happening uh, that in these disaster, largely disaster at site or uh, those in that area, people get affected. I remember uh, uh, when Gujarat, uh, after the Gujarat earthquake, we seen in 1999 super cyclone Nurisa. And there we went and we found that large number of people were traumatized and uh, they were homeless. They were not. Uh, they were not knowing where the better half of the family members are there, where children are there. So a huge dislocation in 1999, and uh, the kind of trauma. Uh, if you have a thermometer of temperature measuring, it will break. So that was the kind of a trauma. I am sure those indicators and uh, enhance must have developed to understand the uh, level of trauma in different individuals. Uh, <coughs> So uh, that was one case. The second scenario came, I uh, really visited uh, after this, Gujar this um, uh, Nepal earthquake. That time I was heading SARC Disaster Management Center. And uh, to uh, take the important call, uh, I had to visit uh, the disaster at site. So we went to Kathmandu and after uh, uh, three, four days, uh, we found that large number of girl child came to us and they were narrating their whole story of trauma. And a uh, few of them uh, were mensurating age and uh, they were mensurating and they were, did not, they were actually at shock that one is the earthquake and second that they were first time experiencing 
this uh, uh, that they are menstruating so do, both they understood as a kind of a trauma uh, due to some injury so they might they were, they were thinking that whether they had some injury uh, internal injury that is why they are profusely bleeding so similar kind of a thing were there and uh, community they were living in the camps uh, i remember visited many of the flood site in the post disaster scenario where the uh, months together people are living in the camps and those camps uh, uh, where uh, ha- that we i wrote an article long back and 10 by 10 where the family of 13 living in the 10 by 10 of the size of the tents and they were all family members they were having livestock with them also so in that 10 by 10 that how the whole family were managing their lives uh, day time they were sleeping differently night in the uh, they were sleeping differently they have a turn basis kind of a sleeping mechanism and many of the psychiatrists they talk about that if you don't sleep and then fatigue is there and living on the highways your your trauma would be entirely different so how they were coping and uh, when the mass scale evacuation takes place uh, and uh, people do not have uh, the minimum basics uh, provided so they go into the trauma the poverty is there livelihood issue is there and day to day kind of a challenges are always there so this is the scenario which we see and we come across and many countries outside the world uh, it's not that only india is uh, kind of a which get affected by various disasters many more countries all the world is also like that uh, i was when in charge of the sarc i could see in afghanistan the similar kind of a, a problem bangladesh similar kind of a problem uh, bhutan i found uh, much better and also sri lanka i found much better than what we found in other countries so in india is a uh, as a kind of a continent so you can't compare uh, maybe one state is doing exceptionally well in management of Uh, trauma uh, uh, post disaster trauma but ideally that how it should go as a kind of an integrated uh, point integrated force uh, at the time of disaster whenever the disaster response force is uh, going into action how that uh, mental trauma counseling uh, team also uh, go as a part of it not the separate uh, in many of the countries we found they move first and then only after the people under the debris suppose an earthquake happened and the search and rescue team are uh, actually uh, going for rescue so what i could see that it is the mental trauma counseling team first uh, get in touch with the victims who are under the debris uh, they counsel there itself so that they find that somebody is there to take care of them so inside the debris you never know the where you are going to survive or not uh, if you are under the debris and only later part they uh, go into uh, i remember one colonel galilee was there and he was sharing his experience while uh, people under the debris and he wanted to uh, uh, this uh, rescue that person take out from the debris and he just inserted his hands and that uh, victim who was inside the debris he unhone bas haath pakad liya kaske aur chhod nahi rahe the so and that took a lot of time to take out from there and he had to manager uh, he was in charge of all uh, rescue operation and he was constantly then he called his team and then uh, uh, the team uh, persuaded the person who were inside that because jo andar dabe hain unko to lagta hai yahi life hai probably the somebody has come and this is the one and the uh, only kind of a uh, support which uh, they might uh, agar ye chale jayenge to pata nahi uh, kya hoga so that kind of a uh, uh, thing uh, uh, that kind of a trauma and in our indian society uh, uh, i see i i come from bihar and uh, when we were growing uh, if anybody is going to take treatment from the psychiatrics so that's a very famous uh, mental hospital was in ranchi so people used to call stigmatize that you ranchi return so ranchi return is becomes as a stigma that you are not a part of the society rather aap uh, kuch pagalpan aap mein hai to psychiatric care koi kehta hai to wo pagal ka doctor hai kind of a uh, analogy people uh, give i don't know how much this had been uh, kind of a uh, uh, this uh, had been addressed so far now people are uh, taking care of that and people are understanding those challenges and in covid 19 it's not a disaster affected at site people who are living and uh, their family members uh, uh, have lost their lives succumb to covid 19 they are into trauma 
my own elder brother succumbed to uh, COVID-19 this year. So the uh, whole family is traumatized. And even though you are not uh, affected directly, but the kind of scenario where people are struggling for oxygen in the bed, you are thinking that who could be the next victim? We do not know. So that kind of a trauma also went into the family. So collectively different kind of a trauma in this kind of a uh, disaster scenario where pandemic or this uh, disaster challenges which we are facing. So that was uh, leading to kind of a, this kind of intervention to understand, inform, educate people, sensitize people that this is not a kind of a pagal ka doctor or pagal ka ko treatment le rahe hai, but this is the need of the hour. Many of the Honorable Prime Minister is talking to the students uh, uh, many times when the exam, 12th exam is there. So just to uh, ease them. So how to ease, uh, provide that if many of the children's committed suicide and one of the panelists uh, uh, in our webinar, she mentioned that don't say that children committed suicide because they were forced to commit suicide because of the situation was like that. It was a, so trauma was there. So how to prevent those kind of a, a scenario uh, which is happening in our society, in our neighborhood, in our family and our close uh, so this is uh, how that we thought that let's uh, plan together and bring them all together on the board. Jinko hum kehte pagal ka doctor ya pagal ka counselor. And let them also uh, say that this is not that what people have been thinking. This is different and is very much needed and it's the need of the hour. Anybody get traumatized. So it's not that pagal ka doctor. So this uh, kind of a myth has to be broken. And uh, there uh, we thought that how community uh, and larger community engagement could be and how this could be available to larger community. Many people do not access these kind of facilities. Uh, many people might not reach to Central University and uh, uh, reach to uh, Subhashis and say that, sir, I am having this kind of a problem. Uh, so uh, how that uh, services can also reach out to the uh, community and see that it's not confined to the NIMHANS or to the bigger uh, central universities or the state universities or state medical colleges. Uh, how that can think, we can think differently with the challenges. Challenges is a now is a kind of a, it's a fathomless. So how our uh, services can go as a online or kind of other services uh, which we can provide where people can access this. If I need any social psych of care, I was thinking that I'm uh, how to come out with this trauma after my brother's death, whom to contact? I do not know uh, uh, whom to contact, how to contact, whether I should contact Dr. Sekhar there or uh, I to, uh, to or other psychosocial uh, specialists. So this is the problem for the uh, large number of people uh, who are addressing this and are facing or going through. Many people do not know even that they have the psychosocial kind of, uh, uh, the, uh, kind of indicators. So how they will get to know or how the other family members will get to know uh, that uh, probably he requires some mental care counseling. Uh, so that kind of a simplified version needed for the community so that we can also understand that if uh, I'm finding those indicators, parameters, I'm just going through that and I'm taking that and saying, oh, I'm into trauma, it means. So whether I should go for uh, meditation or should I consult, uh, uh, like uh, many of the doctors saying in COVID-19, 80% uh, can be taken care at the home and only now 10% require uh, clinical intervention. So maybe here also a psychosocial of same, we can say that 30% you do and 70% we will take care of, whatever the uh, magnitude and intensity. And, but those kind of a simplified version, uh, if any community members or any family members wish to understand, uh, checking that uh, indicators and we see that whether we require that kind of a count. Otherwise, it will gradually increase cumulative and then we will find uh, no solution. And finally, jo hai, ke paagal ho gaya, psychiatric case. Ho gaya. So that kind of a thing should be prevented with the intervention of psychosocial, especially in the post-trauma disaster uh, care. And this happens when people lose uh, their day-to-day -day life. They are into camps for longer period. And also, they, were, uh, they are uh, loss of the, uh, many people will see that loss of livelihood. Uh, people are not in a, a position. Many of the middle class family and they, many higher middle class family, they are into uh, trauma. Now we see that they are not able to uh, provide children uh, fees in their school. Uh, somebody is studying in DPS. In urban area, I'm taking a uh, telling you. 
or in many big schools, uh, one year they could support family, but now they are finding it difficult. So, and that is uh, uh, leading to kind of a, a trauma and also committing suicide. So, you know better, uh, the all experts are there. And I welcome once again all the distinguished delegates and participants who have joined for this particular and very important uh, uh, this uh, uh, webinar. And I'm sure uh, the resource person uh, would uh, Subhashish, uh, Dr. Subhashish, Dr. Roy, and uh, Dr. Atik Ahmed and uh, Madam Laura would uh, provide certain kind of a guidelines or provide some solutions to the people who are listening to you and also to an idea which we can take it forward. So I would stop here, uh, welcoming on behalf of the National Institute of Disaster Management and on behalf of Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal and my own team, uh, Ali Hadar and me and the uh, entire my team of NIBM. Uh, welcome all the distinguished panelists uh, and Central Universities uh, for our community. Thank you very much. Ali, over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for sharing such a precious field experience and practical issues which the community and the individuals face during a disaster and after the disaster. Thank you, sir. So now moving on. I would like to welcome Dr. Vashish Bhadra, Associate Professor from Central University of Rajasthan and request him to make us and participants understand about the concept of psychological first aid how this first aid intervenes and helps in the treatment of mental health of the individual and community victims in context of disaster. Over to you, sir. Yeah, can you just allow me to share? Yes, sir, I have given you the right to share. You can. Yes, okay. So good morning to all of you and my sincere uh, regards to uh, NIDM and the entire team and uh, it is really a great opportunity to be here and talk what is the most essential component in the disaster psychosocial care and the disaster interventions. See we need to understand that uh, mental health is a very important component and the intensity of the disasters are going to increase because we are seeing that the number, intensity, and its gravity is increasing. There are many reasons for that. But very clearly, we know that there is reason of human intention and human inaction and human aggression. A lot of human inaction is one of the main reasons that the global warming and we are getting into much higher problem. The same way human aggression is the reason of war, terrorism, and those kinds of problems. So at every situation, human being is suffering. And the suffering core is the psychological issue. For any health dimension, if we see, the mental health is the core of it. When mental health functions, many other disabilities which are due to physical condition, we can overcome. So in that way, we need to understand the mental health is a very important component. Not going to any theory, not going to any uh, uh, knowledge uh, which is really uh, coming from the book. Let us talk very practically what we can do. We understand first aid. Many of us in our school days also learned first aid. So first aid is something, if there is a cut in the body, we need to give the first aid to ensure that the immediate bleeding is stopped. And if the immediate bleeding is stopped, the chance of healing is higher and the deterioration is less. So that is a very common physical first aid we do. And we know the first aider are not the doctors. The first aider can be a school student, can be a person who is trained, can be a person who can give the basic care and support. So that way we need to understand that the first aid is very, very essential for facilitating that healing to ensure that the initial distress is reduced and that's why that also reduced the future disability so if the care is given immediately then the future disability is much less so that's why first aid is very very crucial and a basic training is enough the same way the psychological first aid to talk about it is about being available being available to someone in COVID situation, being available is very, very important. 
listening to them, listening to them ensures that there is a ventilation. Like it is the situation. If we take an analogy, a pressure cooker on a, on a, a stove, still the time it doesn't make sound, there is a high chance that it get dust. The same way our mind is. There is a lot of pressure around because of the social situation, because of the conditions, so we need to talk, ventilate out. And the pressure goes higher there is when there is a loss, there is a trauma to the person, very individual trauma, like the person is having a death in the family, having job loss, having self uh, problem because of COVID. So these are the typical issues where the person gets again highly affected. But anyone who is living there with this situation of lockdown, limitations, inability to go out, makes us highly vulnerable. So in the psychological first aid, what is essential, what is important that we give confidence, we are trying to reduce the ores. That is most important. As we reduce the ores, we facilitate the better normal reactions. Because all the reactions of ores at this moment are called as normal reaction to an abnormal situation. Being oried is a very normal thing considering the situation. But if the ores continues, then the mental health situation uh, impact the physical health conditions and that creates the disability and that creates the major problem. So that's why we need to ensure a normalization model and that normalization model where people can be available, people can talk, people could listen, being together are very, very essential. So there is a need of immediate help which psychological first aid can give. And it is important that when we give the psychological first aid, what we do like a physical first aid, when we go and try to clean the wound, the blood comes out. The same way the person talks, ventilates. And what happens is that the point of trauma, which is causing the distress, that loses, that loses its intensity. Let me give you an example. Like if we listen a joke for the first time, we laugh a lot. But if we listen the same joke three times, third time, we don't laugh. Because the joke have lost its ability to give the fun once we listen three times. The same happens for the point of trauma, which is causing stress. The stress which is causing disturbance. If we talk about it, the point of trauma reduces the negative negative feeling, emotions associated to it reduces. So we can think logically. That's why psychological first aid need to be given. The same way the first aid can be given with a little training, even to a school student, even to anybody, even to a youth, the same way psychological first aid is. With a simple training, with a simple understanding, people can work as a psychological first aid. So it is the volunteer, it is the Anganwari worker, it is the SAG member, it is the school teacher. Anybody who can be given training and awareness can be available to the people for the psychological fasting. So it can be provided by anybody. So very simple term. What is psychological fasting? It is a very basic practical support. It is a very practical support according to the need and according to the cultural situation and context and it is a very much humanly support and it is very much a situation where we are trying to respond to the fellow human being. It is also about assessing the immediate needs and trying to fulfill those needs. It is also connecting with available social support network. In the COVID situation, if somebody is suffering, then we need to see that what is the reason because of not having job, not having show, what immediate support. Everything cannot be made up. Once we give the immediate support, like it's a cycle, once we push a little, it starts moving. So that little tricking is essential to come out from the trauma. And psychological first aid has that ability to do it. And psychological first aider can do it. So giving the trick that the cycles, the, the, the fan starts moving or the cycle starts start moving with little pulse of the paddle, and then it's gained the speed. So that is the psychological first aid. Initiate, allow, talk, be available, and then it connects. 
so we need to see how do we encourage that positive coping and in certain cases we need refer very less number of cases who need higher order mental health service when the distress continue when the person's functional abilities do not come back to the normals so we need to understand so it is a means of immediate after the event however for the cases who have higher amount of distress they require follow up they require long term care so biological disaster the covid situation is a biological disaster and probably in 2008 ndma has come out with a guideline of the biological disaster also but we need to understand that the mental health guideline also has come up in 2009 so many thing is available but getting down into the community pulling down to the community is very very essential and this biological disaster has a lot of mental health care. so it is like mental health pandemic more than the covid pandemic the origin associated to it becoming or became a mental health pandemic at least you have a data profile to show how many covid cases but we don't have any data profile to show how many is the mental health condition or how it is going back so that way it's a huge challenge and there is no doubt that covid had given a survival challenge so it's a challenge it's a survival challenge and in any situation like this there is lot of hypersensitivity like in gujarat a little bit uh, shaking happens or if uh, uh, wind is going higher in gujarat in uh, orisha people used to feel cyclone is coming or the, after the riot if even there is a cycle tire blast people used to say the bomb blast has happened so that is the kind of situation of hypersensitivity because once the people once the person experience the trauma the situation the origin they are so much deep rooted that there is a tendency to look for those kind of evidences those kind of evidences because looking into those kind of evidences is a matter of preparedness the people try to be prepared so people look for those kind of evidences and try to respond to it so that's why that's become that's become a problem so once we give the psychological first aid and allow them to understand their own reactions in the body and mind then people try to try to understand their situation and try to recover and that is done through the psychological first aid so so if this this condition persists for long then it's become a health issue it's become an illness like there are many studies by icmr in in uh, bhopal gas disaster the people who are affected they they become very very sick when they did not get immediate care and their sickness was not psychological sickness they develop the problem like high blood pressure a lot of issues related to the cardiac problem and then there are problem related to digestive problem which has a definite connection to the exposure to the trauma due to gas they did not inhale gas but the trauma which went on which they could not reflect out that caused so everybody is scared and scared about an unknown enemy so there is an hyper vigilance causing main issues where there is a need of psychological care and psychological first aid so there is in social disintegration and we need to see there is lot of dichotomy somebody is trying to help on the other hand there is casualness there is hopelessness so we need to see that how do we merge and ensure that awareness that helping attitude being togetherness and we also need to understand mental health doesn't exist in a vacuum it is connected with the social realities where we stay so if we create a social support mechanism within the available situation it helps and mental health situation depends on the past experience too and the present realities too so if we see that the past realities the past experiences there is definitely pre existing vulnerabilities poverty disability disease adverse childhood experience and the unstable social relationship pre existing mental health issues so there are a lot of past experiences past situation which increase the vulnerability so what is being seen that the marginalized sections who are the vulnerable become highly vulnerable in post disaster situation and when they are in higher exposure 
so there is an issue that there is an adverse adversity in personal situation family and community situation that increase a lot of problem and in whole way we see that the covid has changed the individual life family life and the community and if we know that how to provide the psychological first aid giving support being together allowing person to talk all this helps and it helps 95 to 97 percent of people and only 2 to 5 3 to 5 percent people require a long term care and follow so if we give that little push it starts moving and that is needed so we need to ensure that how do we cope with this new normal because we do not know actually whether we will have a post covid or we will have a life called post adjusted or covid adjusted post life so we need to be prepared psychologically socially with it so what prevents us what pfa does for us what prevents us from the mental health adversities it is being seen in different research that the people who are physically active even before the covid strike and when they are affected by covid they recovered fast their illness was much less so being physically active is very very essential so physically active people are less vulnerable they cope better they are more resilient and they are less impacted by the COVID. So we need to inbuilt that habit of being physically active. Whether it is poor and in the higher socioeconomic strata, that activeness being yoga, meditation, what we say, I'll just focus a bit within the limited time. So exercise help. A good sleep is very, very essential. Eight hours of sleep, because during that time, the body heals, the mind heals. So it creates the adequate positive neuron connections, which is definitely a neurological connect. And then the age old tradition of yoga meditation, which is resurfacing, but that is most needed and it is being found, it helps. And we need to understand that loneliness is the biggest issue. So if we are trying to connect, if we are trying to facilitate that, it creates the social support network. There is a very important spiritual resource within us. Spirituality is not about religiosity. What do we do with religion? It's very different. Spirituality is finding, finding a peace inside. Spirituality is about our emotional health, where it is connected with, with a superpower, a feeling, feeling being grateful to whomever we believe. So that creates a feeling of gratitude a feeling of hope, a feeling of positivism. And it is being very much seen in case of illness, in case of HIV AIDS, in case of long-term disease, in case of chronic disease, that the spiritual component, use of spiritual resources help in healing. So we need to understand that how do we promote all these things through the psychological side. And we have uh, indicators like, what we use is called as self-reporting questionnaire, which is a very standard format given by WHO, where there are 20 points we can take and understand. If our score is more than seven, we can feel that we are finding difficulties we need. If we go more than 15 or 16, definitely we require help. Like, do I get adequate sleep? Do I have a headache? Do I uh, feel hungry? So all, all these kind of very simple checklists which are given and which are essential at every moment for a self-assessment, for assessing to others, for understanding where the difficulties is coming and who are at higher risk. So who can change? We can change these reactions of the external world by changing how do we perceive the external situation? How? How do we see the external situation? Taking, if we change the perception, it's and there are a lot of a uh, lot of uh, experiment is done about it if i see the external world is very bad i get a bad influence if i see there is a change happening there is a positivity coming up so i try to be positive and i make a positive situation so these are some very seven techniques which are given in psychological first aid which i say ventilation active listening being empathetic encouraging social support 
externalizing the interest, the person, what the person has an interest. If he can sing, can he sing again? If a person can draw, can he draw with the kids? So all these are essential in externalization of interest. Some amount of relaxation, meditation, yoga, and spiritual resources are very, very essential. This is a tool which we have developed and which is still relevant, like the psychological first aid is ensuring safety, providing a safe environment, meeting immediate physical need. As I said, it does not work in vacuum. So you have to see what is possible to different situation, what is available, because government support, NGO support, community support, community resources are available. So facilitating the linking between the families, identifying the needs, all these are essential. And these are very simple tools to say that you can help yourself. So there is a need of individual initiatives. Take the issue as a family issue. So how the family could decide the problem and take simple steps to walk forward. If the school fees are not coming, what best we can do ourselves? So looking into that, instead of taking the problem with the children's problem or with the job problem, when the problem become a family issue, family can take a decision, can share. So that is essential. And bringing that community resource at individual level, the different kind of relaxation, sharing, writing down, the feelings are very, very crucial. So the reality and the PFA are the very, very, there is a reality where the PFA works and PFA works most. So we need to understand in the reality, there is different kind of people, different category of people. So looking at that vulnerability, we need to provide support. We need to reach out to them. But the service can be provided by anybody who is trained. And there are people who need, who need, who require active support. That is the two to three percent who might require referral. The people who are having grief, who have lost their family member, Dr. Proshanth will talk. Or if there is a difficulties with the child, the child issues, Dr. Elora will talk. So we'll see what are the long term issues, but definitely some people will require. And there are people who need support and who can work as volunteer. And we have a lot of community resources. So we need to see, like we have NYK, we have youth group, we have SAG groups. So we need to see whether we can tap those resources. We can use those resources. We can allow them to be available into the community. And that helps to activate activate the available support system for the purpose of dealing with the problems and providing the psychological support. So these programs need to come to the at the crowd. So at individual level, what actually is in that cell, we can say that we need to look at how people can build an active life as a matter of routine, as a matter of habit, as a matter of practice, and how they can do it with the family and friend. So each one become an influencer for others. So you need to create that kind of positive vibes. That's called influencer. Like if you see the fashion influencer, the same way we need to create that psychosocial influencer into the community among the youth who can create and who can give to others, who can make others to follow. So that is very, very essential. And take a good sleep as an individual habit. And if that allows, that creates a lot of biological change. Talk, share, be connected, yoga, meditation, spirituality, writing experience, all this I talked are very, very essential components to build up at the individual level, which through PFA, through psychosocial support, we can work. And with the family, be with the family, have support, talk to each other, encourage empathy, share your feeling, ensure special care, ensure the gender distributed role. Because the gender based violence have increased. So, we need to very clearly understand that recently I was writing, still largely at nowhere we have looked how these issues are becoming very, very crucial and how do we control them. So, we need to rethink that how the gender based issues and the gender based parity need to build up. Because what Sir said, Shantosh Kumar Sir was saying, like the calls you have seen in Gujarat uh, riot situation. The young girl starts at menstruating and it was continuing for long and they do not know what is happening. So at community level, we need to create that psychosocial volunteer, psychological first aider by using the resources of SHG, NYK, all this. We need to develop the support. We need to create 
that appropriate behavior facilitate online support mechanism whoever able to assess and develop that kind of uh, digital volunteers what i say we need to promote the digital volunteer we need to create the influencer psychosocial influencer and we need to create psychosocial digital volunteer who would help even a old person to feed in the covid can get the information how to get the information so this kind of practical support has to come up so actually what we said build back better we can do and we evolve as a better human being which become a post traumatic growth so by using our condition by using our opportunities the covid has given us that opportunity to become a better human being to build a better situation this is overall a model i'll not discuss it here but as a whole we need to connect the psychosocial support with mental health community and other colleagues will talk about it so thank you just i would say to the signal of your body listen to the signal of your body is very very essential they are essential to understand the soul mind and body and if we respond to them we can create a better understanding so i conclude that stay calm and centered we can create that within us we can create the volunteer we can influence we can create the influencer and we can create the digital volunteer by using the community resource for the purpose of psychosocial support so we are in a position to deal with the problem and we can create a better world thank you thank you very much sir for such an elaborative presentation it was very you have put all the technical things in very simple way so we can understand that you have also provided the information about the psychological first aid we which we were not knowing before that what is psychological first aid why it is necessary and how can we provide the this first aid you have also discussed the covid in mental health relation and uh, how the physical activity is must to mitigate the impact and uh, the lo loneliness is the biggest issue how spirituality can help us and you have explained spirituality in very very well manner the psychological psychosocial care techniques that was a fantastic sir so as uh, two of our speakers santosh and you have talked there is a question from a panel from a participant that uh, we are listening around uh, there in news and uh, all around us that there could be the third wave of this covid 19 so how we can judge the mental health of the school children in that scenario very good i think uh, ali we should take up the questions together because dr elora is going to talk about the children and she will focus and talk about it what do you think that we take up the questions at the end yes sir we can but if you can, if you can yes, the party now is question uh, what i would suggest rather let uh, this be so that their anxiety is taken care of so that they can concentrate on the second presentation yes uh, yes any question ha uh, yes, brother if they have raised this question and <laughs> let and us go ahead uh, so thank you you would like to answer yes definitely so what i would say is that at the third wave which we have seen already maharashtra 8000 children are being affected so we know that the third wave may come and it is almost started appearing so the school children will get affected it is like a known feature now when we know that the threat is known till the time we did not have vaccine we did not know how it is spreading we had an unknown fear now we are in a situation where we know where is the enemy and we have identified the enemy is like this so if we know that there is there the, it will come and it is started coming so we need to follow very simple thing like 1 2 3 4 5 the five basic thing so we have to understand that the child needs special care and protection so we cannot expose the child so from the very initial days what is being said that they keep the child as far as possible inside the home if we are coming from outside let us not get mixed with them the person who has to go out and work outside let him be segregated within the available limits of the social situation so we have to follow it and it is also being said that a very young child hugging them kissing them being very close if we are coming from outside if we are regularly visiting outside we should avoid that we should stop that so it doesn't get spread 
second thing that creating a uh, entertainment for the children within the situation so there are a lot of online platform beyond that we as the caregiver the person as a caregiver need to understand the child has a definite need because child doesn't understand the threat child doesn't understand or cannot perceive within the mental state what is the situation so the child needs special care need an explanation so she can draw she can talk or he should be given chance to explain by writing so we need to give the stories we need to tell the songs we need to show the pictures to understand how the threat is so she or he the child become aware and take an adequate understanding what is expected from him or her and the parents caregiver understand what they should do third thing what is being said is about nutrition yoga sleep that has to be inbuilt if we can build it up we should be able to take it very clear fourth thing is being vigilant so we have to be vigilant if there is any situation of any reactions we must be vigilant and ensure that we could prevent it there vigilant doesn't mean hyperactive vigilant means we are vigilant to take an action to prevent it and the last aspect i would say is that let's not worry but let's be prepared so have the confidence the situation can be controlled situation has the lot of understanding now so let's be confident on the science let's have the spiritual resource let's have understanding so develop the scientific practice develop the mental health practice pull from the spiritual resource and behave in your safety nets so create the safety nets around you around the child so you are connected and maintain your safety situations i hope to some extent it might have given some answer yes ali you can take up the next question yes sir so it was a nice answer sir sir this next question that uh, how that there is a barrier because of the lockdown how to interact with community in the times of covid special lockdown how can yes. we can interact yes see lockdown is there definitely we need to understand take care of the lockdown and the covid protocol no way we are supposed to break the lockdown but we also understand what is possible within lockdown in a village and yeah in a urban area so now lockdown characters also have changed so first of all being available doesn't mean only physically present even giving a call and asking how are you what is happening so being connected digitally is the new platform which you need to use and activate like we have seen lot of digital volunteers say in mobilizing plasma in mobilizing oxygen in mobilizing ambulance support this is happening so be connected wherever possible create the group connect them connect through one member talk to others so being connected wherever possible do visit if there is a big field if there is a big uh, place in the rural area there is no dart the place usually so if there is a common place so bring them together maintain physical distance and you can talk you can have yoga together maintaining the maintaining the distance and being that togetherness helps a lot maintaining the covid protocol there is no question of breaking the covid protocol wherever it is possible because when you come to the nature when you come to a green place those kind of chemicals heals our body and those natural situation called as a naturopathy which helps us to reduce the stress so we have to see what conditions they are what condition we are what is possible considering those limitation the physical presence should be considered or else digital platforms should be used so i talked about digital volunteer we need to create the digital volunteers more to get connected within us and we can use the youth and others who have better digital knowledge and can work as better digital volunteers okay thank you yes sir thank you very much sir thank you sir you can invite the next speaker ali yes sir yes sir now i would like to invite dr prashant roy who is associate professor at department of clinical psychology institute of psychiatry kolkata and request him to deliberate his expertise and experience on how the psychological intervention works to cure or treat the mental or emotional crunch with which many of us are living in the ongoing pandemic covid 19 okay and, yeah thank you can you give me the share option
Yes, sir. I have given you the right to share. Is that Mr. Prasanji? Is visible? Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, National Institute of Disaster Management, for planning uh, this topic to discuss about the, the psychological perspectives related to pandemic mental health. And uh, thank you, considering me, for this uh, discussion as part of the panel. Uh, what uh, Dr. Bhadra has discussed about the approach of psychological first aid. Uh, so I am going beyond that. But before I start the discussion, uh, let me uh, focus on some of the stories. This is a story of Antara, uh, who is a psychologist, young psychologist teaching in a school as a school counselor. And uh, she lost her father uh, in uh, COVID uh, around a month back. And uh, what was happening even after the month, she was continuous in the denial mode. She was refusing to believe that father has and died. If anybody was telling about uh, any ritual related to the death of father, uh, she was becoming very much abusive or violent towards uh, that particular person. And th th there was evidence of regressive behavior. Uh, she was uh, showing more cleansing behavior. And the, her talking was more in a childish uh, mode. I uh, was playing in some of the childhood toys. So this kind of regressive behavior was evident. And she was not even willing to talk to any of her friends who are psychologists. So this is one story. Let me go to the, the next story, story of Banti. Banti, Banti is a researcher. Uh, he is uh, doing uh, his uh, research in, uh, in one of the IITs. And he had COVID one year back. And even after uh, one year, uh, he is continuously having sleep disturbance. He is getting intermittent uh, wake up spell. And in the morning, he doesn't feel fresh. And he is having occasional problem of breathlessness for a short period of time with uh, excessive fear that something bad might happen again uh, to him. And he is also having frequent nightmares during his uh, sleep. And because of all these things, he is not being able to focus on his uh, research writing. Now, this is story of Chitra. Uh, she is an undergraduate college student and she is part of a voluntary body who are working for the people uh, affected by COVID or affected by lockdown as pro bono basis. Uh, however, uh, due to some of the experience, he easily gets frustrated, irritated. Uh, and she was telling that if I am telling someone to uh, follow this, this, this particular, now your husband is so sick to hospitalized uh, him immediately uh, and she reported that the wife was telling no 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 we i want to uh, wait for this night at night it might be difficult let me see maybe by tomorrow uh, his breathing problem or his oxygen saturation level uh, might have changed so she feels extremely irritated sometimes becomes very aggressive towards uh, those people wherever she is going to provide her health and all these things are creating a sleep disturbance in her because all the thoughts are coming continuously in her mind and uh, she is telling like I, I must be helping others at any cost. So these are three different scenario that uh, all of us who are working with uh, uh, the people uh, with pandemic might have uh, experienced or uh, maybe the family members are also experiencing similar kind of thing. Uh, people. Now with this in the background, last year I uh, conducted an online uh, survey in West Bengal and in this survey around 1000 people were there and none of them had uh, COVID during that time and, and we tried to assess the kind of uh, the, uh, the traumatic impact uh, they had and un in this traumatic impact we found that around, forget about this data, I am not going into this uh, detail, uh, around 50% of the the total population I found that they had moderate to severe level of traumatic impact. Moderate to severe level of traumatic impact. Uh, but what is going to happen with this 50% of the people as Dr. Bhadru was telling that around uh, 90 to 95% uh, people uh, might uh, recover within two to three weeks provided they get some kind of psychological first aid or the kind of support system 
uh, that in India we are proud of. Uh, so, but there are some among number of people. Uh, we found that around 10.3 percent of the the population who didn't have COVID, they had extreme level of trauma reaction. Uh, and what can happen with these people? We need to. Uh, uh, we need to focus on the entire 50 percent and at the same time we need to have special attention for this particular 10 percent of the population because they are vulnerable. They are vulnerable and that vulnerability can amount to uh, suffer from uh, depressive disorder, anxiety disorders, panic disorders, uh, even uh, suicide, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, all those things are happen. And some of the reports have already suggested that during any kind of pandemic in last uh, previous uh, year, like in 2003, even 100 years back during the Spanish flu, uh, there was around 10 percent of the population who became uh, more suicidal during uh, this pandemic period. So we have to be quite careful about uh, the warning signs and if these particular warning signs are there for more than two weeks, uh, then obviously we, the mental health professionals uh, to be consulted immediately and I'm not going into the uh, details of the uh, warning signs but including it includes sleep problems, significant weight loss, suicidal act, if there is suicidal act or suicidal intent on a suicidal attack, thought better not to wait for two weeks immediately to consult uh, the mental health uh, professionals and if there is increased use of alcohol or drug or if the person is becoming violent or aggressive, all those things are warning signs. Now, what kind of psychological intervention we can think about other than a psychological first aid? So, whosoever is the client, whosoever is the patient, whosoever is the, uh, the sufferer of mental health issues, we need to primarily focus on the psychological first aid for all uh, psychological first aid and that includes the five essential elements as Dr. Bhattara told. We need to focus on where the person is going to feel safe whether with somebody the person is going to feel safe, uh, whether in absence of somebody the person is going to feel safe. Uh, mostly during this pandemic period, the person feels safe when uh, he or she is with the other people. Uh, and we need to uh, uh, try to do something so that the person can calm down a bit. Maybe we can uh, provide if the face to face uh, in hospital basis, we can provide some kind of uh, uh, some water so that the person might feel calm and even in the digital basis or online basis uh, when we are trying to talk to the person uh, we can suggest the individual uh, ki, will you feel better if you take some water will you feel better if you uh, keep one pillow with you or maybe a teddy bear with you uh, to hold on so that you feel more calm and more comfortable so this calming experience can be helpful and connectedness is being already told first connectedness is that your reactions are normal because the situation is abnormal. That is the first connectedness. Second connectedness with whom you would like to stay, with whom you would like to share your experience, your thought. So that is second connectedness. And third connectedness, uh, the kind of problem you are having, having uh, can, will you uh, connect yourself with the helpline or the telecounseling uh, modality? So this is third level of connectivity. And in all these situations, what happens many times when family members are providing kind of support, they give the suggestion and they expect that the, the person who is the sufferer is supposed to implement those suggestions. Here one important point that we need to uh, remember is that uh, we need to uh, enhance the self-efficacy of the individual and we need to rely on the self-efficacy of the individual. We can give some kind of suggestion. Ki, I think probably if you do this, that would be uh, better. But what is your opinion? What you would like to uh, do so the decision making if you keep on the uh, the individual that is always uh, helpful that will improve the self esteem of the individual and obviously uh, finally we need to uh, maintain the hope in the individual that uh, if this problem will be over maybe within two to three weeks or maybe within a couple of uh, a few days uh, we are sure that things uh, the problem that started that will not continue so this kind of hope is always uh, needed. Uh, so that uh, there is a possibility of improvement or recovery. But what happens during grief? Grief is a normal phenomenon. All of us are having grief reactions when there is a loss of any significant member. And there are various aspects of grief. Though uh, 
there are seven stages uh, I have highlighted here, uh, uh, but all persons might not experience all the stages. And sometimes those stages may come in a very haphazard way. Uh, but we have seen that many people, even during this pandemic particularly, uh, the grief reaction is becoming more complicated, more uh, difficult one. Uh, one reason might be this is unexpected, death is very much unexpected. Large number of people are dying, even in some of the families, two or three people are dying. And the third aspect about is there is no closure after death. Uh, there are no rituals, even many people are not unable to see and unable to do the, the funeral process. So all those are creating lots of shocking experience and this shocking experience can uh, stay for few hours to a uh, couple of days that can be a normal phenomena and many people are into denial mode that I discuss, uh, discussed with the uh, story of Antara and that people are not accepting the they, that is also a normal phenomena and sometimes anger can be there anger can be associated with the hospital uh, nursing staff uh, the doctor even towards the family members sometimes towards me uh, why didn't I think before so uh, the anger is another phenomena and the bargaining is another issue bargaining means uh, uh, sometimes accepting the death again no 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 probably there was i'm thinking in a very wrong way how can i think that the person has died no this is not uh, good and then the depression appears in the individual and with the depression the person start testing uh, the realistic solutions and the gradually acceptance happens it can take one week it can take uh, more than, uh, around one month for some individual but if it is going more than three weeks and uh, then obviously we need to uh, focus on that particular person and uh, show that his or her grief experiences reduces and for grief experience we need to remember that uh, there would be some phases where person will be having more grief reaction and there will be some phases of life where and the, the person will have less grief reaction and it is and sometime during the holidays and uh, during some particular days the grief reaction would be more prominent and this grief reaction to some extent can continue throughout the life it doesn't mean that all the grief needs intervention all the grief needs intervention one thing that we need to focus on grief is a normal phenomena and there is no need to hurry up do need to put pressure on the individual that you come out of the grief immediately then it would be good for you no we need to give, give the uh, uh, some uh, kind of uh, there are individual differences and uh, we need to give some time uh, to uh, help them with their own resilient capacity each and each, every individual is having some amount of uh, resiliency and some of the other thing that we can do is uh, in uh, grief counseling and the family members also uh, can review what are the grief reactions in the thought, what kind of emotion the person is experiencing, what kind of behavioral reaction the person is having, and what kind of biological reaction, like how is the sleep, uh, how is the energy level, how is the appetite. So these grief reactions we need to uh, review uh, by asking the individual, and then we can rebuild the relationship of the patient with the disease. Uh, what kind of relationship the particular uh, person used to share what are the things you liked in that particular person uh, so how will you evaluate the relationship what kind of name you would like to give to the relationship what are needs used to be fulfilled with the particular person what are the things you didn't like about the particular person uh, what are the things the person didn't listen uh, to you so the both the positive aspect and the negative aspect of the relationship uh, we can ask to, uh, to the person uh, without forcing the person to accept the, uh, the death. So that has been found to be quite helpful. And sometimes description of the sequence and consequences of the events which had happened just before, during and after the death. Understanding of the entire process, the past, present and the future of the death experience, that can be helpful in accepting the death, some people. But it may not be on the very first day, maybe sometimes on the second day or the third day, we can go for uh, this sequencing of the event and we can explore the associated feeling uh, about uh, that the person is not here unable to see there is a confusion that the person uh, may not be uh, leaving so what kind of negative feelings and uh, the person is having 
Maybe at later period we can also explore some of the positive feelings. Yes, person experience, start experiencing after two or three sessions, some kind of positive uh, feeling associated with it. And uh, maybe by, through remembering of some pleasant uh, event with a particular person, some positive emotion might come up. So those things can be helpful. Consider possible ways of being involved with other people. What are the needs that you that used to be fulfilled through this particular person? Uh, are there any other individual that to some extent those needs can be fulfilled? So this is another important issue to deal with grief. So the important is whether it's a loss of a person or a loss of a relationship. And we need to communicate the, the relationship space for the life. And it is only the absence of the person, the physical absence of the, the person. And uh, whether it's the loss of a person or the loss of the needs, mostly we'll find that our needs uh, that used to be fulfilled to that particular person, we miss that particular uh, issues prominently. Sometimes writing a grief letter can be helpful. And if you can write down addressing to the deceased person, and maybe we can uh, uh, leave that letter on the water uh, to flow, that can be helpful. Uh, getting some kind of support system uh, during this grief period can be quite helpful. And again, some people again having difficulty uh, uh, in telling that, okay, one family member has died, how to communicate to the other member that is breaking bad news. I might not be able to go to the detail of breaking uh, bad news because of the time, but uh, here we need to find a, a comfortable place uh, where the person would be uh, willing to talk. Then we need to assess the kind of perception the individual is having, kind of knowledge the individual having, uh, that what kind of suffering that the disease person had, uh, what kind of difficulties uh, you anticipated, what doctors told. So this kind of perception that we need to assess, then we need to invite that particular person that we would like to discuss about the kind of suffering that particular person was having. Are you okay? Is it okay for you? And to discuss, uh, is it fine that we can discuss about and uh, the kind of problem had? Once the person accepts the invitation, we try to give some kind of knowledge. What was the treatment? What was the symptoms? What was the diagnosis? Uh, uh, all those knowledge we uh, try to uh, provide, and then the emotions comes up. We acknowledge the emotions. We facilitate the emotion. We allow the persons to show the emotion uh, with empathy, and then. Uh, we think about, we plan about what can be the next session, what are the things we need to focus, how many days the person so we need to uh, talk to. So all those are part of breaking bad news. What are the other interventions for other problems like breathing or muscle relaxation exercise can be helpful. Slow inhaling, then giving a pause, then slow exhaling. Uh, and while you are inhaling and exhaling, uh, it's just be aware that your chest must, must should not expand. You'll, it is your abdomen. Okay? You are relaxed. Your shoulders are relaxed and not tight. So slowly, uh, maybe for four to five seconds, you inhale, then give a pause so that you are aware about that you are taking a deep breath and then let it go slowly. If you can practice it for five to 10 minutes, that can be extremely uh, helpful. Uh, mindfulness means becoming aware about what is happening. Mindfulness of our daily activity whenever we are eating, uh, if you can be mindful about uh, the taste of the food, the texture of the food, the smell of the food, the color of the food, even when you are taking bath, the, 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 when the water is flowing on my body, the kind of experience, kind of sensation that I am having in my body, I can be mindful about it or I can be mindful about the normal breathing that is going on, just being aware about it. Uh, what, when, whatever time possible, one minute, two minutes, that can be extremely helpful. Three minutes breathing space, it is having three components. It takes three minutes. First component is awareness. Sit in a comfortable uh, posture, uh, maybe on chair, uh, with a straight body in a dignified position, maybe with closing eyes. And just be aware about your body posture. Just be aware about the kind of thoughts you are having, kind of body sensation you are having, kind of emotion you are experiencing. After this awareness, then you gather. The gathering is anchoring. And where, where you are anchoring? You are anchoring your normal breathing. The breathing that is going on, just focus on the breathing. Just be observed when you are breathing in what is happening, when you are breathing out what is happening. After gathering for one minute, the third part is expanding. And then when you are breathing in and breathing out, 
what kind of experience you are having in your facial expression in your other body parts so that is expanding uh, it has been seen that if you practice the three minute breathing space four to five times daily uh, and along with whenever i am having some emotional difficulty thought related difficulty uh, as sos uh, it can help in uh, coping with the, the difficult situation when there is a storm inside the sea uh, what the uh, sailor do with the ship uh, he doesn't do nothing he does nothing he only throw the anchor in the ship it doesn't stop the storm it provides a kind of stability so this anchoring or gathering is to provide the stability not to get rid of the storm if it is reducing the experience of storm that is to be considered as bonus there is panic control technique people are experiencing a lot of panic attacks nowadays and what they do they try to inhale more and more so that they can get oxygen more it doesn't happen what has been seen that instead of inhaling if they focus on exhaling slowly just let the carbon dioxide uh, move out uh, and the uh, the breathing will be in an automatic process so through exhalation many of them are able to control their planning strategy sleep hygiene is a technique where uh, to maintain a particular time for sleep wake up time uh, going to bed time if the uh, the getting into sleep is taking longer time uh, it should not interfere with the wake up time so it should be uh, fixed and then cognitive restructuring is come to many people uh, will have some kind of irrational thought irrational expectation we can question them the, what are the evidences why are you thinking this uh, who told this about you the person is telling probably that i am going to die but uh, where from you got this information that you are going to die uh, how many people have told you that you are going to die uh, how much you believe that you are going to die die so the questioning this kind of expectations can be some kind of helpful to discover that my thought was not even rational and trauma focused approach is there various techniques i am not going into the detail of it and for volunteers self care is one of the most important thing before i start going for volunteerism we need to ask whether we are ready to help and sometimes the friend is telling me ko chalo 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 help karte hain bahut zaruri hai and because my friend is telling i am going to that no we need to ask whether i am ready to help are you connected with a group or organization for safety or coordination that is important akele akele help karne jaane mein problem zyada hoga just be with an organization so that you feel more safe and connected second during uh, volunteerism what are the things you can do how can you stay physical and emotionally healthy that you have to focus on proper nutritional food no much gap in between food and uh, the sleep time should be proper uh, again you can practice some of the breathing exercises uh that can be helpful how can you know your limits that is important everybody cannot do everything and volunteerism doesn't mean uh going beyond my capacity whatever the your capacity is communicate to your voluntary group and go by that otherwise you are going to be the victim are your expectations are rational and see what other person are going to do that is under not our control and uh, what i am going to do that is under my control so many people might not follow a lots of thing uh, let us unconditionally non judgmentally accept them ki okay, whatever the, they are thinking based they are doing what can i do about it it nothing and how can you and your colleagues support one another that is important whenever having some kind of emotional difficulty share with your friends or peer members so that they can support each other and after your volunteerism is over how can you take time to rest recover and reflect uh, that is important a uh, issue of uh, self care so that next time whenever you are going for volunteerism you are more resilient more modified uh, more organized with this thank you thank you very much sir for such a descriptive presentation uh, very wonderful presentation you have narrated the story of antra banchi and chitra with the different situations and conditions you have also discussed five essential elements uh, to focus on that is a safety calming connectedness self efficacy and hope you have also shared the life uh, everyday life experiences the six steps uh, of breaking bad news and uh, the self uh, you have also talked about the self self care is also necessary in helping others so that you could not be, become a victim thank you very much sir thank you moving on i would like to welcome dr atik ahmed 
assistant professor department of social work central university of rajasthan and request him if he can tell how the ongoing pandemic covid-19 is affecting the mental health of survivors and their teens and what could be the long term psychological effects of this ongoing pandemic covid-19 over to you sir thank you sir can you uh, allow me to share the uh, ppt yes sir just a minute bala ji please uh, make him presenter yes sir you are now presenter yes okay. yes are you able to see now yes sir yes yes thank you uh, so good morning one and all uh, uh i thank the organizers to uh, give me this opportunity to present my views on uh, the covid-19 disaster and how we can like you know understand uh, what's happening right now and what can be a long term effect and at the end i would also like to uh, show or like you know give my views on how to how we can overcome uh, this thing at at a larger level in a systematic way uh, i thank uh, dr subhashish badra my colleague who has been able to uh, introduce me to uh, this group and uh, yes <clears throat> so the topic uh, which i am going to talk is on impact of covid-19 disaster on mental health of the survivors the present and the way forward so understanding the impact of covid-19 yeah so covid-19 as a disaster has impacted on the social structure of the communities it has created an immense barrier on the usual functioning of the society psychological distress is common among the victims also with socio economic distress which is ongoing right now uh, vast number of individuals and communities are affected by disaster and it will have a tremendous impact on community functioning health mental health and well being which we are already observing or witnessing and uh, there will be an also an economic and social development which is already disrupted throughout the world and uh, the most uh, impacted is the education system so we are from education system and the uh, uh, second most impacted is the health system uh, which has also uh, you know interrupted uh, as a terms of social development <clears throat> so what happens when a disaster happens and uh, there is a mental health and developing in developing countries it is seen that uh, they are more prone to disasters or hazards due to the various challenges like poverty lack of resources lack of educational opportunities poor infrastructure and lack of trained manpower lack of awareness and knowledge of disaster mental health uh, though this disaster we have been like uh, seeing it for almost one year and it may continue for some more time maybe months together so already we have seen that there is a uh, lack of educational opportunities job opportunities we have uh, uh, infrastructure which uh, is unable to manage the demands of the health uh, of the uh, people around and the lack of trained manpower to look for the knowledge of uh, disaster uh, uh, so and as well as the mental health in the disaster so uh, now uh, i would say that this covid-19 is a typical disaster now what happens in a disaster as we have seen like uh, there has been hurricane cyclone earthquake floods etc what happens there in such kind of natural disasters is that there are houses are disrupted whereas here the houses are safe and it's like completely opposite okay so uh, and lifestyle changes have occurred though the infrastructure which we have uh, is intact like you know the roads the transportation etc which is intact but then it is non functional and if we, even if it is functional we are unable to uh, use it because of the lockdown situation where we are not not allowed to go out and things like that our freedom for movement is restricted and the most impacted dimension in this disaster in this typical disaster is the income generation and the health okay and the social life of individuals and communities so though uh, these are the aspects which promote uh, uh, resilience and coping and uh, you know overcoming the situation 
but those situations uh, like you know in, in this typical disaster these situations are impacted right now so uh, so what happens uh, mental health and disasters in india we have seen that mental health issues in general have been considered as a neglected subject especially as in india as it is considered as a stigmatized problem in some places uh, uh, still it is not uh, like you know spoken people do not approach they don't take it uh, as it is okay mental health issues are caused by disasters are even more neglected area in india uh, though now for past two decades or so at a state and central administration level efforts are made to mainstream mental health needs uh, it was uh, seen after the uh, tsunami that uh, a lot of effort was taken up uh, around uh, in and around india where uh, you know disaster uh, mental health and issues with related to that the psychological first aid which was required were provided in a systematic way so uh, learnings from that has helped us to uh, look into what can be done in the present situation so generally the disasters are measured by the cost of social and economic damage okay this is what generally happens but there is no comparison to the emotional suffering a person undergoes during and post disaster of course uh, emotional suffering for a person is uh, unique and uh, we cannot compare it to any person but then still uh, it's not much looked after uh, as a uh, team effort when considered to the social and economic damage which is uh, being carried out and since this is a intangible aspect like you know we cannot just touch it reach it and people do not come forward to explain all such things it, it goes under the pages or it's it's not like you know frequently uh, spoken or discussed or looked into <clears throat> so what happens in a psycho uh, disaster the psychosocial consequences we see that uh, the psychiatric illnesses are uh, very few okay and though uh, looking at the covid 19 there may be a chances that psychiatric illness may also be increasing the behavior change is seen as a little bit higher or more than uh, the psychiatric illnesses. And uh, looking at the COVID-19, that vast communities have uh, uh, had a different setup that uh, people are forced to stay back at home and uh, which they were not doing it because uh, staying back at home was, uh, uh, you know, uh, was not common because many of them engage into different activities education or job etc and homes were used only mostly for retiring and refreshing and again engaging into but then here what is happening is that we are all uh, forced to stay back at home so uh, we need there are changes like you know we have to adopt changes so the behavior of people uh, would certainly will be impacted the fear and distress response uh, though in the first lockdown was not seen much but then uh, in the uh, second lockdown or the second wave, the fear and distress response is alarmingly increased. Okay, what happens is the psychological footprint in a disaster, the size of the psychological footprint is greatly exceeds the size of the medical footprint. Okay, so this is why we are here to discuss on what are the impacts of, uh, uh, what are the possible uh, impacts of uh, COVID-19. So let's look at the previous disasters, what has occurred, uh, though references have been taken from uh, uh, disaster studies, researchers which have carried on, uh, uh, you know, the cyclone, the uh, earthquake, etc. So it's a summary which I am presenting here. So mental health outcomes developed various psychological symptoms such as severe stress after the traumatic experience, uncontrollable feelings of grief and sadness for a prolonged period of time, substance dependency adjustment problems which affects the proper functioning of the individual as well as the community resulting in family conflicts uh, the last point is more applicable in covid 19 due to the situation we are uh, living in present okay uh, the most commonly reported problems were persistent grief a state of shock and fear maladjustment and dysfunctionality severe several victims were diagnosed with mental disorders comprising of the symptoms such as avoiding a specific situation with a fear of being rejected or humiliated, a state of constant sadness and uncertainties, failing to understand uh, the cause and response 
causes and re reasons behind the grief fear of social and persist socializing and persistently avoiding social situations this these are the lessons which we have learned from previous uh, disasters and it can it is applicable here also uh, the psychological and behavioral symptoms observed were unnecessary fear, a state of uh, suspiciousness, para paranoia, obsessed thoughts. Okay. Obsessed thoughts, uh, I would like to specially uh, talk here about obsessed thoughts. Uh, that uh, what we are presently uh, living in situation is where uh, we are made to, uh, you know, constantly look at uh, sanitizing our hands. Okay. So, uh, this is going to create a lot of uh, problem maybe in future also that many people might develop a habit of uh, you know cleaning their hands uh, even after this uh, particular disaster would have uh, gone or the covid-19 situation would have surpassed uh, even after that there may be a chances that people may become uh, habitual to obsessed uh, uh, i mean cleaning of their hands and uh, which may result in in uh, obsessive compulsive uh, kind of uh, dis uh, disorders. Uh, severe mood swings and forgetfulness is what another thing which is commonly seen in disasters. That after the disaster, where people uh, have lack of sleep, guilt, loss of interest uh, in in various activities which they used to do previously, which were more engaging and more learning and fruitful and probably people may not engage because we are uh, almost one year uh, we have not engaged into physical activities our children have not engaged into physical activities so probably there will be a loss of interest in uh, physical activities like sports etc which might uh, have to uh, be you know inculcated again after the uh, this particular impact the fear of encountering situations self-blame suicidal ideation and consistent worry about future uh, previously i mean last year we did a study on people uh, youth who were uh, involved in isolating themselves uh, due to the uh, covid 19 and they were mostly in secluded situations where they had to stay back alone in their uh, uh, in a house so uh, what we found that they had uh, a lot of uh, suicidal ideations and worries about their self and health because uh, during those days the disaster i mean uh, covid 19 was not understood properly and they lived in a continuous worry that what will happen to me if i get uh, the covid 19 uh, uh, illness okay so what will happen if i become ill and though i have kept in isolation and since they were not in touch with uh, family members or friends because of the physical contact the uh, thoughts were more uh, disturbing to them because entire day they have to think over it uh, rather than engaging into some meaningful activities which uh, they used to do okay so the in pre uh, a few days back uh, one of our students engaged herself in uh, collecting uh, information from youth for her msw uh, research about like you know what are they consistently are they consistently worried about future so 60 percent of youth who uh, have already responded that they are consistently worried about their future they are looking for job perspectives uh, they are not aware where they will go and how job will uh, opportunities will come and how they will be able to support their family and build their future so uh, long-term care is needed and the long-term care uh, was needed for the psychological problems which resulted from uh, disability. This is based on the observations from previous studies, previous disasters and followed study. So the disabilities, uncertainties of future, broken social units and rehabilitation issues. The victims who had direct and indirect experiences of uh, disaster showed prolonged behavioral and cognitive symptoms for which psychological rehabilitation was needed. <clears throat> so uh, what is expected uh, impact of COVID-19? A specific expected uh, impact is that loss of daily routine, which has already happened, and probably this may not return to normalcy very soon. 
because unlockdown situation is going on but then uh, looking at the uh, infrastructure the opportunities the education system which is not yet open and may take long time to reopen and return to normal see so the loss of daily routine is uh, already present the loss of uh, resources which used to uh, you know let the life go on okay um, we, this is also not there okay and i don't know how long it might take for building up uh, these kind of resources uh, lack of control over one's own uh, possessions and loss of social support so people are saying that i do have uh, so many things which i can use uh, for example uh, their own motorcycle or a cycle which they can use for physical activity but they cannot uh, right now because uh, there is a restrictions uh, which have been imposed and uh, loss of social support uh, though it is available through uh, telephonic conversations but then uh, the family the friends and the relatives okay those extended families uh, they are also in similar situation so uh, extending social support to them is uh, becoming difficult uh, okay uh, the deviation from normal life is already impacting the uh, all the uh, you know victims who are survivors of this and it may be extended for another few more months uh, so the impact can be seen not right now maybe because people are coping to the situation understanding that the situation demands our uh, behavior to be in such situation uh, in such way but then uh, maybe looking at uh, how things would uh, come up again after the normalcy returns um, probably the social support the uh, friendship friendship and the peer support which is there uh, may not return back in the similar way which was happening like use of uh, uh, peer group and uh, going to uh, hanging arounds or uh, recreation activities which were there maybe we are going to see a uh, different uh, changes in such kind of activities which might require for us to look into uh, you know uh, how to develop uh, without any much of impact on this kind of uh, situation uh, for future uh, concerns of the younger generation of people uh, there is also uh, the impact is also associated with elevated levels of acute psychological distress in previous disasters so looking at specifically how uh, covid 19 is uh, impacting uh, there is uh, like you know bereavement or death in the family so almost uh, many of the families would have faced this situation so there is a grief and depression already uh, previous speaker spoke about uh, what might be looking into that people are unable to uh, do the uh, last rites of their uh, uh, families okay so it happened uh, in many places that they are unable to do the last rites of their families in the way their uh, religious and tradition demand so there will be a grief and depression and also a feeling of guilt which will be setting in among them that we could have done better for the family or we could have done better for my mother or son or a daughter okay so lockdown and isolation as an event is impacting on anxiety depression Uh, exacerbation of existing psychotic symptoms because many of the people are unable to uh, go back to the clinics uh, to you know follow up with their uh, mental health providers and psychiatrists to take up medicines it was difficult in uh, we have seen that in previous lockdown when the uh, hospitals psychiatric hospitals were not yet open so uh, so there is uh, you know the already existing psychotic symptoms might have become uh, more uh, pro, uh, more increase in substance use and other addictions can also be seen and there will be uh, there is always an educational impact so fear of potential economic impact uh, as an event uh, is looking at the it's going to have there is going to be an anxiety and also people right now might have been already setting up into a depressive uh, you know episodes where uh, they might be thinking that uh, they have lost their business they have lost their uh, you know just imagine those people who were street vendors okay and uh, small time sellers who used to be on the platforms or the shops where uh, they have to bear the 
so many costs, uh, including the uh, rent for their shop, electricity bill, etc. So, uh, looking at the situation, already uh, they would have been uh, depressed, and anxiety will be that what might come up there when this lockdown will open, when we will go for again earning uh, all these things. So, adversely affected personal relationships, uh, like including domestic violence. Uh, can be one of the event in this and uh, like anxiety, depression and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorders can be seen in a near future, which is uh, which has projected. And uh, like in a medium to term impacts of the SU syndrome uh, after hospitalization, people might face anxiety, depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Bereavement uh, uh, can be prolonged traumatic grief, complicated grief. It can turn up into a complicated grief. Okay, uh, psychological impact of frontline staffs already uh, those who have uh, day in and day out are engaged in uh, looking at uh, looking after the patients. They may have uh, experience PTSD. Actual uh, economic unemployment job, which I already explained previously. So I will not uh, uh, say that the long term impacts are already there. <coughs> yeah. So what are the symptoms like, you know, how to identify uh, all these things are happening or not? How to identify this and how to uh, look into what can be done for uh, overcoming this mental health uh, issue? So the symptoms which are observable will be Discrete, de, sorry, decreased appetite, digestion issues, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, sleep disorders, exaggerated startle responses, which can be seen in children as well as in uh, adults. Irritability, post-traumatic stress. Okay. Uh, symptoms which we might need to explore to understand whether uh, the impact is there is like, you know, we have to look at the fear and anxiety. It can only happen. Uh, only when we discuss, we talk to the uh, survivors and understand from their level what kind of uh, uh, thing, what kind of uh, symptoms are there. Um, yeah, Dr. Badra already spoke about SRQ. Okay, uh, the self-reporting questionnaire, which is twenty items, uh, which can be uh, quickly assessed about this fear and anxiety. If uh, he was talking about the caseness of seven and above. The score is seven and above. Yes, uh, all these symptoms uh, can be shown, seen in that. So the fear, anxiety, increased hostility with siblings, somatic complaints which can be uh, explored, school problems among the children, social withdrawal among the uh, youth and adult, uh, decreased interest in peers, hobbies, impact on academic performance, all these things which we uh, can explore and see that whether uh, people, the survivors are affected with uh, this particular uh, uh, disaster. There are also like, you know, expected changes need to be observed. There are children, uh, which is in general population, also in children and general population. Uh, changes in school Could you performance. Please make it yes, short at the, as we are running out of time. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I will do is I will skip on this. And I will go with is like, you know, si done okay what can be done is we need psychological sub, uh, first aid provision of psychosocial support building coping and resilience these are the three things psychological first aid already uh, dr uh, badra has spoken so, provision of psychosocial support uh, which is required so skipping on all this i'll just go to this yeah okay so this is like uh, uh, international federation of red cross and uh, they have like uh, given this model where uh, the normalcy is there, the impact happens, impact has the stage, then after that relief, recovery and development, and then again, normalcy has to return. So the stage uh, relief, recovery and development, we need to intervene as mental health workers. Okay, what people need to do is, uh, yeah, we need to create uh, mental health workers, volunteers who can, uh, you know, we need to train them required to provide support in terms of active listening, understanding, uh, assurance of strengths available within them, promote resiliency and active uh, care and positive coping. So, uh, 
I'm just giving you some uh, thought over it, like, you know, what, who can be involved, short-term training programs to health workers to, to identify psychosocial issues and implement referral services to designated psychosocial centers, PCC, et cetera, involvement of NGOs and teachers in schools need to be identified. Uh, involving hospitals or health centers to conduct camps in promoting uh, uh, psychosocial support in surrounding communities. Colleges and university students can be trained uh, through NSS and Red Ribbon Clubs can be uh, you know, sent to the uh, nearby communities to uh, explore the providing the psychosocial support. CSR centers in industrial setups can take up this to extend support to workers as well as surrounding communities. Uh, ASHA workers are there, self-help groups are there, and youth clubs are there who can be uh, trained uh, and mental health can be uh, done with them. And there are also like children clubs which can be uh, made the, where older children can take care of the younger children, identifying that the problems are there and they can bring to the notice of healthcare workers Religious institutions can be involved, and uh, we can also disseminate the information through uh, involving celebrities, social media, and also like we can make short uh, videos for uh, resilience coping information, which can be disseminated over uh, the uh, social media. So uh, these are all things which we can do to build a resilient community, which can respond to crises in ways that strengthen community bonds, resources, and community capacity to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It was a very elaborative presentation. Moving on to our last panelist, Ms. Elora Barik Shell, Associate Professor, Psychiatric Social Work Institute of Psychiatry. I request her to focus on the psychological condition of a vulnerable section of community, that is the children, women, and elderly people how COVID-19 is affecting the mental health of the vulnerable section of the society. Over to you, ma'am. Can you, uh, uh, you know, sharing uh, at your level, I'm an, yeah, okay, I did. Thank Please you. Please allow me to share. Yes, ma'am. Balaji, please make her the presenter. Yes, ma'am. Now you can present. Is it visible? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, it is visible. Do it full screen? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my topic is uh, children, women, and the elderly challenges during the pandemic. Okay. Uh, since I am dealing with the children, before I go into this, I would like to share a story. There was a man who was very rich and he was a Muslim man. One day he wanted to come to the uh, for prayer. So when he came to the mosque, he came in his big BMW and he just parked the BMW and he walked to inside the mosque, just leaving his sandal outside. So when he went inside, he prayed, he thanked the Lord for everything he has got in his life, his position, his status, everything. And when he came out, he saw that his sandals were missing. So he was very upset. He immediately, his concern was he had to walk in this barefooted to his BMW. So what he did was he was praying to God and he was telling God, how could you do this? You know, I am such a respected person in the society and I have to walk till my BMW now in my bare feet. When he was saying this, he suddenly saw a man coming out of the mosque. He was literally on his knees. And he was using his hands to come out of the mosque. He had a radiant smile on his face. So he went to this man and he asked, 
what makes you smile this is so hot scorching heat and you are smiling and you are using your like hands to come out i really don't know how can you smile the man replied i am happy because i was able to come here to god's home i am happy because i am healthy still today i am happy because i have a nice family and i am going back to my family now i am happy because i lay i stay in plastic shanties and i don't stay on the pavement and i am not totally wet in the downpours or i am sweating in the scorching heat and lastly i am happy because i know you are the person who is going to now drop me at my home because god has sent me sent you to me the man was shocked because that was his lesson he picked up this man took him to his car and dropped him at his residence so my topic is we are all talking about the disaster and my topic is the way you focus on your life the positive attitude towards life okay now i will give you a alarming feature there are about 2.2 million uh, children in the world who constitute approximately 28% of the world's population we all know the most accepted modus operandi in this pandemic is isolation and social distancing strategies there has been innumerable studies which has indicated that compared to adults this pandemic may continue to have increased long term adverse consequences on children and adolescents a study proved that the quarantine children experience greater psychological distress than the non quarantined children 68.5% had worry 66.11% had helplessness and 61.98% had fear in this pandemic children experience disturbed sleep nightmares poor appetite agitation inattention separation related anxiety irritability clinging behavior they express lower effects of uh, lower levels of effect not being able to play outdoors not meeting friends and not engaging in the in person school activities due to prolonged confinement at home children's increased use of internet and social media predisposed them to use internet compulsively access objectionable content and also increased their vulnerability for getting bullied or abused now we talk about the special needs they also encountered lots and lots of challenges during the pandemic confinement in one place increased their hyperactivity now when we also talk about the underprivileged children they were more vulnerable to depression anxiety suicide exploitation and high dropout rates isn't it alarming all the research which shows all the negatives now let's talk about the positives like the man who said a different realization of the life he didn't have anything but he had everything because he had that positive outlook to life so let's do this pandemic planning have we ever thought this parents physical presence this undivided positive attention and reassurance is a blessing for our children let us focus on that increased awareness of the children about the pandemic only through age appropriate authorized organizations like who unicef that will increase how many of our children have this awareness about the surroundings they are always into the book but because of this pandemic they can get they have got this awareness they are actually reading the reports of unicef and who to alleviate the anxiety of the children let us monitor let us give them the news but let it be monitored and let it be encouraged we are inculcating a very good habit in our children to go into the news parents can be the best role model for the children we need to focus here 
that we need to be the role models because we are at home and we can be the best role models for our children. Have we ever thought children have become most responsible, most accountable and most structured because they are getting up, they are opening the computer, they are sitting in front of them, they are doing the class. Please go back before the pandemic and think you are running after them with your tiffin. You are running after them with your water bottle. Do you do it now? We have forgotten to see these positive things in our life. These are the positives which I want to focus. We are exploring their creative pursuits. We are sitting with them. Our creativity is being increased. Their creativity is being increased. They are drawing with us. They are singing with us. Have you ever seen the sky? Have you ever seen a sun sunrise? Have you ever seen a sun uh, uh, like going into the west? No, but now we are doing this. These are the positives and we need to focus on this because that is mental health. Teachers, we a lot and lot of survey on the children because my child is into a school and I interact with her and her friends and the parents. Teachers are into more creative online academic and non-academic sessions, making the classes more and more interactive. Children love to do that. They are being given projects. They are doing it in the computer. They are sending it, sending it. We always focus. They are in the computer. They are this. They are having. But if we just shift our focus and focus on this, we will see there are so positive things which we are just overlooking because of the pandemic. More focus on the pro-social behavior, emphasizing human virtues like empathy and patience. Do you know how empathetic they are now? Please speak to your children, children in the community. They are so empathetic. They have the patience. They all ask, when will the school open? When will he go to school? Yes, they are missing their school. That is their second home. But they have learned to be empathetic. They have learned to be patient. And we can help them to understand that social distancing is not equivalent to emotional distancing. What do we have to do as the mental health professionals? Coordinated and innovative mental health care delivery with children, parents, teachers, school counselors, community volunteers, NGOs, police, and everyone. We have to motivate them to do this innovative mental health care system for them. We are already into this teleconsultation facility for the needy. Recognition of the physical manifestations of the stress, emotional health problems in the children, and planned intervention for the same. Identification of the predisposing and precipitating factors associated with the child's current manifestations. Why is the child doing this? Where is the predisposing factor? Let us explore. It is not only the pandemic. There are other things also. I am coming home. I am sanitizing. What, what impression I am putting on my child? My mother is worried. My mother is tensed. Developing stronger networks and pathways partnerships with the mental health professionals that is another another role where we have to play now we all talk about this uh, pandemic i would just like to share one essay from a child who was asked to write about corona <laughs> teacher asked the students and the child wrote Karuna is a big Chinese festival celebrated by both young and old all over the world. During this festival, schools, markets, churches, etc. are closed and exams are cancelled. Everybody wears masks during this festival. It is the time when every school going children gets a smartphone as a gift from their parents. During this festival, daddies learn cooking, washing, and cleaning, while mummies and children spend their time with mobile phones. I love Corona Festival very much. See, this is a child's realization. A child who has been asked, don't we think the child is more talented than us? Yes, because the child is not thinking about the pandemic. The child is thinking what the child has got. And we, because we are so tensed, because we are so stressed, of course, we really need those. But I, my focus is, can we just shift and look at this part also? I can also give lots of lots of research on women and elderly, but I will not go into that. I will just focus on the challenges of the women and the elderly during the pandemic. 
lots and lots of misfort information are there that are not un unreliable, that are not incomprehensible, that are incomprehensible. And there are fake rumors. If you do this, you will not get this. If you eat this, you will not get this. If you do this, this will not happen. So those are the misinformation. There is well-being and mental health. There are depression. This has already been talked by all my three distinguished panelists. And they have talked about depression. They have talked about stress-related disorders. They have talked about panic, substance abuse, low immune system. Yes, these are the challenges. There is nutritional vulnerability. There is malnutrition. There is disruption of necessary food supply. There is shortage of adequate materials. There is, of course, economic vulnerability. There is loss of job. There is no job. There is financial constraints. There is violence and exploitation. Of course, there is discrimination. There is gender equalities. We have lots and lots of research on battering and physical violence. But what should be our focus on? Our focus should be on the community. It shouldn't be the service delivery. It should be the community-based approach. Why? Let me explain. Service delivery is reactive, but community-based approach is proactive. Service delivery is needs-driven, but community-based approach is the core problem-driven. Service delivery has minimum participation. Community-based approach has the highest participation. In service delivery, we do the top-down approach. But in community-based approach, we have the bottom-up approach. Service delivery is a one approach. Community-based approach is constantly reinventing approaches. In West Bengal, we are all worried about the second wave, in the, uh, about the corona. But last week, we were all, all worried about the cyclone Yash. So we are every day, we, with every week, we are constantly reinventing approaches because that is the community approach. Service delivery creates dependency, but the community-based approach, the power shifts to the community. There is a community ownership. Let us, let us empower our community and they will take care. There have been lots of questions. What will happen? The third wave, wave is coming. What will happen? The children will go. What will happen? What, what is the mental health of the teachers? Let us not focus on those. Enough, we have focused. Let us now focus on the positives because we need to give a better environment to our surroundings. Service delivery is static, but community-based approach is adaptive as the situation changes. Service delivery, there is low training needs, but in the community-based approach, we have the high training needs because we have to focus on the ownership of the community. Now, what should be our approach to our disaster preparedness? That is the community-based approach, involvement of the community volunteers. It should be culturally sensitive. Correct information dissemination should be there. We should enhance our social support system. That is the main thing. We can be in isolation. We can be quarantined. But we can always have this connection, this mental connection. Why isolate them? Why discriminate them? Why have this stigma? Let us actually take them. Let us have this mental connection with everyone. And we all will overcome it. Because I believe we can overcome it. Strengthening the mental health care centers and the rehabilitation centers. Because people should not feel that they are left alone. In your community, you have this rehabilitation center. In your community, you have this mental health professional. Call them up and they are there to help you. Institutionalization of the psychosocial care services along with the available infrastructure in the community. We will give the psychosocial care, but we will use the community infrastructure. So that will be much more approachable. There should be continuous collaboration and coordination with the different stakeholders. This, uh, since I'm from the Institute of Psychiatry, we have actually done community-based approach with children during the pandemic. These are the people who are, these are the professionals who are into the field, working with the children, helping them to learn how to sanitize your hands, how to be, how to use the COVID protocols. So this, this is the approach, community-based approach.
This is with the women, the community-based approach with the women from the Institute of Psychiatry. This is with the different stakeholders during the pandemic. This is an awareness program, and this is, in nutshell, my presentation. Thank you very much, ma'am. It was very interactive presentation. As we are out of time, so we can't take many questions, but uh, we can take a few. So there is a question from a student. How is COVID affecting the mental health and studies of the students studying in higher classes in a positive way? If any of the panelists want to answer it. OK, just let me, with the looking at the time constant, let me just quickly give an outcome that, uh, yes, the students uh, have a lot of positive outcome. Like, what is first positive outcome is that students become very responsible. What Dr. Elora has already said, that they become responsible because it is not driven by the teacher. They have to be proactive to learn. So what we have seen, that the good student become good. But the challenge is that the student who are not so good, who are below average, is facing real difficulties. They are not able to come up. So the good students are doing much better, but the below average who needs teachers push a little more, who are not able to take up, is having problem. Another, they are at home, comfortable situations. So the people who have the comfort at home have a separate room. They are doing good. But on the other hand, the students for the first time got a separate bed in a hostel, doesn't have that. So those kinds of students who have those problems are really facing very difficult because there is a joint family, cannot get a real uh, space to study like in higher education. So getting problems. Third aspect, I would say there are a lot of lab-based course. A student has to do it, a lot of looking into it and then trying out. So the student who is able to afford, who is able to do it with some other connection is able to do it. But there are many students who are unable to afford. So I see that digital divide has come up. The digital divide is making the people who are able to get it doing better. So you need to rethink that the people, the students who are unable to get the services, how to reach out to them. But as a whole positive, I said these three aspects, we see that proactiveness, doing it, everything is increasing. One danger I would say is the digital dependency, which is also coming in different research. The student surfing the restricted side because they have got for the first time, particularly the adolescent student of ninth and 10th children when parents are uneducated, unable to monitor what the child is doing, are getting into those kind of digital addictive risks. So we have risk, but still, these positivities which are coming up are definitely need to be nurtured and sustained for future. They become much more digitally advanced. Any other panelist can respond. Thank you. If anyone wants to add something in this. Any other yeah, I uh, just want to say Nothing that uh, a lot of self-learning is happening uh, with the students. And uh, though we used to see that uh, peer learning, uh, like, you know, weaker student being uh, getting in information from a, a, a better student uh, has uh, but self learning uh, they have to find out their own resources and learn that is happening uh, quite a lot yes sir thank you thank you sir so we are moving to the concluding session so i would like to invite again professor santosh kumar for his uh, short concluding remarks sir over to you sir Thank you. Uh, it was a wonderful session uh, listening to everyone. And uh, a lot of solutions uh, have been suggested, what have been practiced out uh, before the COVID and uh, after the COVID, uh, which is when the, there was a slash and then the second wave came and the concern for the third wave as well. Uh, like uh, NIDM is also having a working group and uh, where you can contribute. Uh, on uh, this uh, how to prepare for the third wave and especially in relation to the children's uh, care and uh, in the third wave uh, 
what is the possibilities of uh, kind of a likely to affected uh, children and uh, how this could be uh, what kind of a strategy which we can suggest that each of the state government and the community can take one is the suggestion for the government another could be for the community and those community institutions can come into a kind of a forefront and take care of that as all of you have spoken about uh, that and uh, the various initiatives which have been very successful during that time and uh, uh, some tools uh, which uh, i flagged in the beginning that uh, what are the essential tools which you think is important to understand the trauma care uh, and how the habit and behavior could be a kind of a, a positive story was shared that how uh, children uh, they are looking at as a kind of a when they are writing essay uh, in their school and uh, Uh, many of times we are thinking pandemic, but many a times it is also thought as a kind of obviously. So understanding the minds, young minds, is much more important. Their engagement of uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, in our uh, neighborhood, also we find that children are the moment they get uh, even if the smallest of the kind of a uh, opportunity to come out and interact, their peer group and they are playing and uh, everything. so uh, one that probably we need to understand in this kind of a trauma care that what is the likelihood of infection rate amongst the children in the third wave and um, uh, during the first wave and the second wave uh, we were of the view that uh, children will not be a much of a career kind of a thing but some study said that they are possible potential career but uh, <laughs> disease will not be a kind of a very serious and two of the cases Uh, which were brought from Maharashtra, uh, large number of children got affected, and also uh, other states also. There, the doctors are saying that although large number, ten percent of the children got affected in COVID nineteen, but the severity index was much less, uh, and so hospital care was not. There. So that also protects uh, parents also going into trauma, and also that children going into the trauma. so how we can draw these positive stories uh, for uh, uh, building our own capacity mentally that how mentally we can get alert which you people have uh, beautifully narrated through case studies uh, and uh, that was brought in uh, nobody went out and they don't have opportunities and many a times they become orphans children are also becoming orphans this particular uh, covid wave 2 Uh, it's been the example of uh, kind of uh, uh, children getting orphans. So taking these two lessons and also the case study uh, which was also presented uh, by uh, Professor Rao uh, and uh, then uh, further elaborated by Mr. Ahmed uh, when the first uh, presentation was made by Mr. Subhasis, Professor Subhasis. So when we combine all together the learning, which we say that that. Uh, that it has to be given top priority the mental health care number one and number uh, this cannot be uh, negated and it should be brought in the forefront for the preparing for the third wave and also for any other disasters which we are likely to face one example came that during from west bengal that during the covid 19 there was also a kind of a disaster so the in west bengal in orissa and uh, in uh, gujarat Uh, in mumbai so this kind of uh, examples are coming which is a kind of a cascading impact of disasters one that uh, communities are affected by pandemic the other is community are also getting affected by uh, the disaster which is occurring due to natural activities and the third is that poverty and other challenges which are there so what we say that it multiplies so uh, mental uh, well being depends on many factors and uh, in what factors the people are uh, positioned into so there we uh, the suggestion which have been offered by all the four distinguished panelists would be very very useful for us in uh, taking this input i'm sure that uh, you would be sharing your powerpoint presentation and even if you are having some problem in sharing that powerpoint you can share your content uh, which we can use in the kind of a Uh, the other report and this report or the workshop of this report will go to the working group report, and there we can bring in those issues what we have flagged. 
So, and the questions which have been uh, asked by the participants uh, in the beginning of the uh, this uh, webinar, and which will be addressed by all the distinguished speakers. So, I'm grateful to all of you, and the kind of presentations and the kind of good learning and a very kind of a thinking that you have given a very positive environment that in how in this positivity the mental state and trauma could be taken care of whether it's a wave one or wave two or wave three and subsequent waves or maybe any other disaster signal we need to prepare and if you are prepared the challenges are and uh, the impact would be reduced to minimum so i express my gratitude to all of you and thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, one that being with us, coordinating with us, and making your views, uh, uh, sharing your views with the larger audience. And for this, we have definitely benefited. So my team, uh, Mr. Ali Hader, uh, our executive director, Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, and all the technical team who is uh, working behind. Uh, so I extend my heartfelt thanks to them. And also, uh, we are grateful to the participants who are there and attended this program. Without them, it would not have been a very, very successful program. So uh, I just close here. Uh, if Ali has to say something, then uh, he can say. But uh, on behalf of India, one, once again, I extend my gratitude to all of you. Thank you very much to the Central University, uh, Rajasthan. Thank you very much. And also uh, our resource person from Kolkata, uh, she, uh, brought the major part from thank you very much to all of you thank you sir thank you very much for your concluding thank you everyone it has been a wonderful session as a formal vote of thanks i would like to extend my sincere thanks to major general manoj kumar pindal executive director of national institute of disaster management i would also like to extend my sincere gratitude to professor santosh kumar for his guidance for the success of this webinar and uh, I would also like to thank to all the guest speakers, Dr. Shubhashi Bhadra, Dr. Prashant Roy, Ms. Ilora Barikshil, and Dr. Atik Ahmed. We are very gla glad that uh, you could take you could take out your precious time and share with us your experience and precious knowledge you have. At the end, I would like to thank all the participants for showing interest and being with us throughout. With this, we would like to conclude the session. Stay safe. Stay healthy, all of you. Thank you all. Oh, the story of BMW. Thank you. <laughs>